Today is September the 19th. Actually, this message I've put, I think, I think the title page slide is up on the screen. Um, I, I, God's got it. And the room. God's got it. We seem to be on, uh, I don't even know the right name, MMM, I call it. Uh, Faye tries to make sure I at least say it correctly. MMM, it's kind of a multiple message part. MMS, uh, and um, there's someone who's on uh, the the MMS that responds to prayer requests. I don't know who it is. I don't want to know who it is. I just think it's clever. Uh, there's one uh, person that responds with, I'm on it. And every time I see that, I just think, how about that? That's just, uh, I'm glad, or I got it, or uh, just phrases just like that. Uh, and I see it often because there are many prayer requests that come through, come through our realm, and um, that's, a, that's a name, that's a phrase. Uh, and I've decided I would change it to God's got it, because sometimes I've read, I think my memory is, I've got it, or I'm on it, or I'm with it, or I will, or I'm praying, or uh, in the MMS. It always catches my attention. And actually, this message began last Sunday morning at the end of the service. We had a family that was visiting us, a homeschool family, uh, who with the wife had been to our building on many, many, many occasions uh, we have some homeschool families that have come for nine years. One of the gals said, uh, my kids have partly grown up in this building at New Covenant Fellowship. And uh, this gal, I don't think that she's been coming for nine years, but it's been multiple years. And uh, as she uh, exited the sanctuary at the end of the service last week, she said something very cute. She was, she, she was trying to be honoring. Uh, she was trying to be humorous. And she said something to the effect, this is the first time I've been in the building many, many, many times. Uh, actually, I'm here every week during the school year. But she said, this is the first time I've been in the room. And uh, I kind of looked at her like the sanctuary. It's always off limits to us. And today we got a chance to, and that's the way she phrased it, Today we got a chance to be in the room. <laughs> I thought it, it was kind, it was complimentary. She wasn't putting it down. It's just this is a part of the building that's just not really been opened up to us and sort of available to us. And I just thought it was a cute way. It was a humorous way. It was an interesting way. Little did I know that uh, I believe God was tying the beginning of the week with Close to the end of the week, it was Friday afternoon because we got a chance I've put up here. The room has a double meaning. It's the, it's, it's the phrase that uh, the wife used last Sunday exiting the sanctuary. I've had, I've had a chance to be in the room. And on Friday, as a part of the celebration of life for Lisa, uh, they gave um, a tour, Delta gave a tour uh, of their a part of their facilities, the main thing was going to be the museum. They have some kind of a museum down there, and they were going to include an invitation to the room. That there are several passages that are really uh, anchor passages for me. They're they're, re they're anchor passages, and one of them um, is. There's anchor sections, Isaiah 40 through 46, is probably such an anchor section of Scripture for me. But uh, chapter 40, there is an event that takes place that Isaiah is, is speaking to the, the Lord, really, through Isaiah, calling his prophet to speak to what I believe is an experience that's common to mankind all around the world in every phase of life in every phase of history in every century this was written by Isaiah so we're multiple hundred years before Christ so th this was expressed by people who were you know more than 2000 could be 25 could be 2700 years ago that is totally relevant today the room So I want to read out of Isaiah 
three verses that, that picture that tension, dynamic circumstance that everybody at some point in time, men, maybe many points in time, you find yourself in. This is how Isaiah said it in chapter 40, verse 27. And I'm reading this out of the Amplified Version. Um, it just adds a few more words, a little more uh, explanation that I find on occasion is very helpful. Out of the Amplified. Why, O Jacob, do you say and declare, O Israel, my way and my lot are hidden from the Lord? Meaning, where I am, what I'm dealing with, even the Lord does not really know it. People can become convinced. God has been so busy keeping the planets and the galaxies in place, the things that are going on in my life, and sometimes, especially when it's a more difficult season than not, and it just seems to be going longer than you thought it would go. So, what was the declaration of Jacob, of Israel, of people 2,500 plus years ago in 2021? What can be the declaration of people? Maybe it was what filled you back in 1997. Maybe it was 1972. Maybe it was 20, 2017. Maybe it was, well, it, who knows when it was. Maybe it was uh, 2015 to 2020. Maybe it was a five-year time period. Maybe it was where, why, O oh Jacob, do you say and declare? So this is Jacob. He's saying, you've declared. This is something, uh, O oh Israel, my way, wh wh where I am, uh, the path that I'm on, the journey that I'm on, my way and my lot what has befallen me, what I deal with. My journey and what I deal with are, are hidden from the Lord. And my right is passed over without regard from my God. That was the complaint. That was the declaration. That's, that, that's what came out of the heart of people that God had Isaiah address. So he addresses it. That's Isaiah 40, 27. So Isaiah 40, 28, Isaiah speaks to it. The Lord speaks to it. He's using his prophet to speak to it. Have you not heard? Uh, have, you not, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary? There is no searching of his understanding. I mean, his understanding is so, is so wide, is so high, is so deep, is so broad in any dimension you want to go, it is beyond our capacity to understand it. And then he says this, um, lift up your eyes, and this was before, this is verse 26, he said, um, because uh, Isaiah talked about the creator, God's the creator, and so this was the comfort. He was saying, the people who were saying, my lot, my path, they are not known to God. In other words, I'm outside of his sphere of knowing. I'm outside of what God knows. And I'm here abandoned, so to speak. And Isaiah said, this is in 20, verse 26, lift up your eyes on high. So take a look. Lift up, look at the heavens, look at the stars, and see. Who has created thee? these? Who's the one that created these? So it could have been a starry night. Uh, when Isaiah wrote this and he could have looked up and, and seen, it could have been a crystal clear night and where he saw stars and galaxies, distant galaxies and um, who, who knows. We have the capacity through the resources today to see a long way off and see pictures of incredible trillions and trillions of stars. Who has created these? He who brings out their host by number. That means they're numbered. God has a number for each star. Most of them are just a burning mass of gases. The vast majority of them, that's what they are. Burning masses of gases. And God's got them numbered. 
And how much more important are you that Jesus would die for you, for me? How much more important are we that He would die for us? God, the eternal Son, through whom the Father created, would die for us. So He's trying to give them some frame of reference that maybe there's some day when you're, you're being swept with Where's God? Does he even know what I'm dealing with? How hard this is? How long this has been going? Does, does he know? Isaiah's counsel was, look up. You see them? They've all been created. And he's got them numbered. Reads like this in the Amplified. Who brings out their host by number and calls them all by name. Through the greatness of his might, and because of his strong, he's strong in power, not one is missing or lacks anything. That means he has them named. He's got a number associated with each one, and he's got, he has them named, given them a name. And you think God doesn't know you, doesn't know where you are? This is what Isaiah is saying to this reality of humanity who's looking to God and doesn't understand what's going on and why it's been the way it's been. And Isaiah said, look, look up. The Creator, God the Creator, has created all of them, and we know there's now trillions of them. And everyone's numbered, Isaiah told them, and everyone's named. Incredible. So... A second dimension, um, son-in-law that I had, Chad Joyner, for many years, uh, this almost was his absolute all-time impactful verse. At least he went through years where I'd hear Chad say this frequently. He'd say, he'd read out of Matthew or quote out of Matthew 10.30, uh, Jesus was speaking to them about the value of sparrows, of the value of life, of people, and two sparrows, aren't they sold for a penny, and... Uh, and there's not a bird that falls that God's not aware of it. How much more important are you? And then he said this, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. That means each of us, because the Bible is available to all of us, that uh, God has our hair. Now for some of you, uh, that's taking a pretty, you know, he's had to add to his computer because the number changes, uh, the number of hairs that are on your head. Um, and uh, I'm experiencing my hair, the gal who cuts my hair is convinced my hair is growing and it's getting thicker, and um, she's one who doesn't believe in thinning shears, and she's gone to using the thinning shears, and I told her, you're, you're using the thinning shears, and she said, I've talked to people about you, uh, that I've got, uh, I've got a client whose hair, I have to use thinning shears, and he's in his 70s, and his hair, he's getting more hair. So um, I think God, that does it stretch God? No, uh, but he's, you know, he's keeping track. If the hair of your head are numbered, he knows what that number is, I'm convinced, regardless of what the number is. If that detail, it's like that gives a picture, a snapshot of how much aware of you and where you are is God aware? He's got your hair numbered. And so where they wanted to take us was, she said, this is the Delta Operations Control Center. We want to take you to the Delta Operations Control Center. I've renamed it The Room. And she said, very few people get a chance to see the Delta Operations Control Center. Really, it, it'll take you about a half hour. Probably took us about 40 minutes. It, you really ought to see it. Um, as I said, I, I, I think in the realm of the Spirit, I got prompted to say yes, because initially it was certainly a no that was inside of me. And just it just didn't sound all that interesting. Little did I know the experience that I would just have in the Delta Operations Control Center. I've given you, I'm showing you a picture. The room is about the size of a football field. Well, like if you've been in Nayland Stadium 
and you've seen the whole area that's what with, that's grassed down there, including the track around it. Um, that's about the size the room was. So the picture that I'm showing you is just a tiny portion. I mean, a, just a tiny portion of the room. On uh, at the busy time, the room is occupied 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and. Um, uh, during its peak hours, that means when planes, the peak hours of planes flying, uh, there'll be about 350 people in the room. And, uh, but there's, there's people there, they have, if I understood it correctly, there's 12 hour shifts and they work 12 hours on and there's another shift that comes in. And um, so it looks like that, it's all in one big room, fluorescent lights, it's a little dim in the room. Uh, and you can see uh, the, a number of monitors, so giving you another glimpse of it. Uh, this is a common sight in the room. Uh, and these stations, men, women, uh, different nationalities, um, as I said, on an on a intense time, busy time of the day, there's 350 of these people at workstations. And sometimes they have as few of it. looks like this man has uh, maybe two, maybe three monitors in front of him. Um, and sometimes it looks like this, uh, and this guy's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's got nine monitors that he's keeping track of information, and uh, they began to tell us about all the information that the Delta Operations Control Center keeps track of. Uh, th they have about 900 airplanes. They keep track of every airplane. They know at any moment where every airplane is. Uh, th in this instance, when they told us uh, on Saturday, there were 10 airplanes that were down in repair. The rest were either waiting to fly, were available for fly. They were scheduled for flight. They were waiting. Um, they, they keep track of all of their personnel, all of their flight personnel, and uh, they know how, how long they've worked. There's only a certain number of hours a week that they can work. They know where everyone is, how many hours, and if they need to shift this person, instead of going to Atlanta, they need to fly to Washington, D.C., or what have you, because of the amount of time they have left. And they have to keep track of everybody, all the personnel. They have people, sections, that keep track of luggage, so they know about all the luggage. They keep track of the plane, how many people are on the plane, how much weight, how, how much fuel the plane is carrying, how many other kinds of things, uh, whether uh, he gave the story, they were bringing planes up from South America that some of them had gold bars. So well, what, what else they could carry on those planes was real different than sometimes they have planes carrying flowers up from South America. So they know the weight of everything. They know how much luggage can go in. They know how many passengers. They have people, a whole squad of people that are keeping track of the weather. They're looking at wherever, wherever planes are flying, what's the weather, what's the forecast, and are guiding planes in and around. They keep track of the passengers. This was stunning to me. They have about 450 passengers on Friday that would be flying. No, this is not a commercial for Delta. It's, 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 an, it's an understanding of the room. They keep track of every customer, and they have a whole squad of people that are watching the social media of those people when they are on the plane and get off the plane because they want to see if anybody has had an unhappy visit and they've, they've, uh, they've touched their Facebook and they explain to their Facebook all the things they're unhappy about and they want to get in contact with a person and see what happened and how can they rectify it. They want to do that as quickly as possible. They want to stay in contact with people if it's snowing or raining or sleeting and they have to cancel flights so they can cancel them as soon uh, ahead of time. They have to keep track of every plane that's on the ground and the taxi time. There's only three hours or four hours for an international flight that they can stay on the ground with people in it. So they're keeping track. They're moving planes. So somebody sitting in Atlanta has the authority to tell them, okay, plane number 27 in Pocatello, Idaho, it needs to be advanced up to plane number one because it's been on the ground for whatever reason for they're coming real close to their three hours and they need, to, they need to go to slot number one. They keep track of that. They keep track of everything. Food, they keep track of the meals, how many meals, how much it's going to weigh. Are there enough meals for enough people? So there's a section of people that are, that are keeping track of that. 
and uh, of uh, it was overwhelming. It said on some of their uh, advertisement literature for the room, it says that they have the largest spreadsheet in the world. And the heart of all of their information is a spreadsheet. And they said there's no spreadsheet that's the size of Delta's operations center, control center spreadsheet. Uh, they have what they label as their war room. It's probably got 30 to 40 chairs and chairs facing big monitors up in the air. And, and you can pop up a microphone and pop up a, a laptop that pops up on it. And that's when uh, twice a day they have conferences in that room. It's their war room. If there's some crisis going on, like 9-11 certainly is a crisis, uh, like uh, hailstorm, sleet, those kind of things. They gather all the leaders, the heads of the sections, and they're in there and in their war room, and they, they make decisions. And there's a single individual that is the ultimate decision maker, and he's the, he, he, he has... He has around him uh, uh, the leaders of the, all the different areas, and they are feeding him information. And if a critical decision has to be made, um, he is the one charged with, he makes the decision. So he has these big monitors in front of him. And we had a chance to dialogue with him, and I, I asked the question, well, how did, how did he earn the right to sit in that chair? And uh, so he got off of the chair and came over near us, because our guide asked him, and he got off the chair, came over to us, and he said, well, I started, I think, 34 years ago, something in the 30s, and um, I started out in uh, package. I, I, ha I handled packages, uh, baggage. I, I was a baggage handler. That's how I started, to where he sits in the Delta Operations Center, the number one chair. It was overwhelming. I think the thing, as I said, that they track the social media of every passenger who is uh, flying or getting off for who knows how long to see are they posting anything negative about Delta so they can contact them and see how can we make it right. They keep track of everything. They are so prepared that this room about, they said a few miles, so they didn't really tell us how many miles. I'm going to say about five miles. I don't know what the number is. About five miles away, they have a duplicate room in every fashion. It's duplicate. It looks exactly the same. So everybody could take up from room A, and they could go over to the duplicate and the computers there would have the same messages that they worked on the last hour. And when their phone rings in their desk, it rings in the duplicate room in the desk where they would be sitting. If they have nine monitors, then this person's workspace in the duplicate has nine monitors that look exactly the same. And they do that because if there should be something happen and it goes down... Uh, they wanted a backup system that they could go to. And the backup system is not just they wanted to have another uh, PC available that they could keep track of everything. It's a room that 350 could work in comfortably at any time. And it looked like I'm in the same place. I know I'm in a different building in a different part of Atlanta, but it looks like I'm exactly where I was because that's how they've done it. It was overwhelming to me. How much information they handle. Uh, if they have planes that are flying, he said, we don't fly over any of the stands uh, in, in, in Europe and uh, in uh, e Eastern Europe, especially in former Soviet bloc countries. He said, we don't fly over stands. If we're flying into Russia, we, he said, we have to have people who are working on uh, passes so they don't shoot us down. And I said, that's very complicated and very taxing, but we, we, we have a whole team of people that's doing that. It was overwhelming. It was one of those occasions, it was just stunning. It was the room. So I put this, Delta Operation Control Center knows a lot. 
I don't know how far in the past they keep records. Uh, I'm sure in terms of weather forecasts and so on, so they could uh, make prognosis. Uh, I, I, I'm, they, I'm sure they keep models and all kinds of things. The present, it's like, it seemed like they know everything. They know if there's a problem on an airplane, somebody's not wanting to wear their mask, or somebody's mad at the waitress, or not the waitress, the um, stewardess, someone's mad at the stewardess, they know about it. And they're the ones who make the decision what they, they do. Uh, so the past, the present, and they try and know a lot about the future, and I mean by that, what kind of weather are they going to be running to, what's, what's facing them, and so it leads me to this. What does God know about you and every other person in the world and every person who will yet live and every person who has lived? Now, the magnificent Delta Operation Control Center does not know all that. They have a lot of information about the present and people who are flying on their planes. It was staggering. But what does God know about you and not only you, every other person in the world that operations center couldn't even begin to touch that. Couldn't begin. And they're pretty fancy. And every person who will yet live. Delta Operation Control Center doesn't have a clue. And every person who has lived. Delta Operations Control Center doesn't have a clue. But it, the magnitude, the intensity, the computers, what does God know about you? He knows everything. What does God know about every person in the world? He knows everything. Well, that, no, that's not how I picture God. It's how the Bible pictures him. What does God know about Every person who is yet going to live, God knows everything. What about all the people that have lived since creation? God knows everything. Does, does he have a team of, well, he's got 24 elders. I'm with the clear impression, all of this, the room, and of which this is just a, a speck compared to what God processes, has knowledge of, is aware of. It's just like a speck of dirt, and I'm probably making it too big. The room. Compared to God. So, the Isaiah 40, especially the end of Isaiah 40, where, look, he's got every star numbered and named. He knows about you. The Matthew 10, he's got every hair on your head numbered. The third place in scripture that is so meaningful to me is Psalm 139. Quickly, out of the Amplified. Oh Lord, you have searched me and thoroughly and have known me. You've searched me thoroughly and have known me. These are all going to be out of the Amplified version. And so the author is speaking, but it's true for all of us. You've searched us and you've known us. He is the room. God's got it. Uh, verse 2, you know when I sit down. So when you sat down in this room today, God knew it. And when I rise up, when you rise up, he knows every one of us in this room and every room that exists on the whole planet. God's aware when every single person sits down or stands up or lies down. Delta's amazing. They're not that good. You know, when I sit down, when I rise up, my entire life, everything I do, you understand my thought from afar. He knows our thoughts. Now, some of you who are wanting to live uh, a self-centered, uh, self-focused life, 
All of this information is scary to you. You, you want to say, I want out of here. I don't want to hear this. You want to live an unaccountable uh, life. You're not accountable. This is not good news to you. If you want to live a life where you're doing the will of God and you're so thankful that he's tracking, he, he didn't create you, wind you up and just said, okay, go off. You know, I hope, you, I hope you're able to do what I really hoped you would be able to do in your life. If, if This is so comforting to me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, my entire life, everything I do, you understand my thoughts from afar off. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. So he's not only aware of your path, he scrutinizes it. It means he watches it carefully. And my lying down. And you are immediately acquainted with all of my ways. Every now and then I have an experience that helps reinforce that's got you you're aware of my path you you're you're aware of where I am when I'm there and uh, just oh my goodness now how how could God do that one of the most classic times is we uh, had a trip to Israel we were going to the temple mount we were going to uh, stand in the formation of Ezekiel's temple and we were doing that because we wanted to pray in the spirit we We'd made other trips to the Temple Mount to pray in the Spirit. We wanted to roughly approximate, just in a guesstimate way, uh, Ezekiel's temple out of Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, out of Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. And we were going to do it on the Temple Mount, which is kind of illegal, but we, we wouldn't have Bibles with us, and we would just act like we're just watching birds in very specific locations. And we'd had somebody with a GPS, and they were coming and marking places, so we'd be standing quite exact. And we had, a, we, had, we had a team of people, and we wanted to do that. We didn't know for sure, because I couldn't make up my mind when would we go. And uh, finally decided we're going to go the uh, third week in April. And, and, and Vicky was ready to pull her hair out because it took me so long to make up my mind. When are we actually going to take the trip? Russ, you got to. We've got to buy tickets. And then I did, and then uh, a couple who I really wanted to be on the trip said, we can't go, but we can go the next week. And so after it was all set in motion, I changed the trip to the next week. I'm saying that to say, God picked the date. I didn't know God picked the date, but God picked the date. Because he wanted us to be there on a particular day. I didn't know that. I thought it was my inability to make the final decision so we we go there we fly and we had a group of people back here who they were doing in this room at the exact same time on the clock so they were kind of in the morning or you know if we were in the morning over there they were still at night here seven hours back uh, so you have to back up seven hours if we were on the temple mount at nine in the morning so back up six five four three at three o'clock in the morning they were here in this room and they were doing the same they knew what we were doing they had we had it all planned out and uh, so the day we were in formation on the temple mount um, uh, we weren't allowed to have bibles you can't have bibles on the temple mount and uh, paul bradbury w was here on that morning Faye was on many of them and this particular morning he came in the back door and and he kind of said, you know, they can't do this, but I've got my Bible, and they're doing Ezekiel 40, and so I, I want to read what they can't do right now at the exact same time period. Time zone's different, but time period. And he said, I happen to be using the New Living Translation uh, for the, a year or two, and I change Bibles, you know, types every two years, just because I just found it, it's helpful. You may not like that. Okay, try not to get worried about it. And so he said, I'm in the New Living Translation, so I'm going to start off in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. So he starts off reading, and he said, on April 20, it starts off, Isaiah, Ezekiel 41, starts off this way. On April 28th, well, that's the day we were there. That's the day we were on the Temple Mount. That's the day we were standing in the formation, it just kind of roughly, simplistically equivalent to the corners of the Holy of Holies, the corner of the temple, the corner of the courtyard, 
uh, those kinds of things. We were there. And he, Ezekiel talks about how this being picked him up and took him and to a mountain overlooking a city, the city of Jerusalem, opening, uh, overlooking a building area. It was the Temple Mount. It was on April, the, it could, because they translate the dates and so on into our calendar. Um, it, it was on April 28th. So we went back to our room. I think it actually was the, the next morning um, that uh, Paul texted. Uh, I was rooming with Rusty Ortner, and he texted Rusty Ortner, and he said, hey, this is cool. He said, uh, do you know, you guys, you ought to read Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 40 out of the New Living Translation. I, I think you're going to find this interesting. So Rusty did. He had, you know, something that gave him all the translations. And he started, he said, Russ, listen to this. He said, you know what Ezekiel 40, chapter 40, verse 1 says? I don't really know. You know, it's Ezekiel and the vision starts of the temple. That much I know. Well, here's how it starts in the New Living Translation. On April the 28th, and I said, no, it doesn't. It does not say that. There's no way it says on April the 28th. Because we, we found out the, technically the next day. And I said, that's where we were on April 28th. We could have been anywhere in the world. We were in Jerusalem. We could have been anywhere in Jerusalem. There's so many sites we were on the Temple Mount. We could have been anywhere on the Temple Mount. It's 32, 34 acres. There's lots of room up on the Temple Mount. We were standing in formation, kind of approximating Ezekiel's temple. And I believe God, I said, it, it can't be saying that. It's not true. It doesn't say April 28th. It does. I was so speechless, I almost couldn't talk. I just didn't know what to say. It screamed to me, I know where you are. Actually, I'm involved in getting you there at the right time. You know, almost could hear the thoughts of God. You, you kind of made this one a little difficult because you wanted to get there a week early. And that, that's not what I had planned because I wanted you to be so staggered and stunned that your m life would be marked and would never, ever forget this. That I know where you are. I know your path. I know you're lying down. I know when you're awake. I know your thoughts. I know what you're doing. That was such good news. Can never be taken away from me. Never. Uh, 139.4 Even before there is a word on my tongue... Still unspoken, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. Oh my goodness. He knows what we're going to say. Delta Operations Control Center doesn't know that. God's got it. God does. Is he aware of where I am, of what's going on? The psalmist answered it so thoroughly and so completely. Yes, he does. Well, why is it seemingly so silent? Could be trying to develop your faith. Could be trying to develop your stamina. Could be trying to develop your holding power. How is your holding power going to be increased? By having to hold. How is your faith in the, in, in the awareness of God? How is that going to increase? And become stronger. And so because you have to st stand for longer time periods. It, it only comes that way. If you live in a, a realm that's a growing realm. That starts off in infancy. And, and grows hopefully to maturity. And then to older. And so everything you learn is a process of learning it. So everything you learn in the realm of the spirit is a process of learning it. And some things are long in development. That's an incredible statement, verse 4. Even before there is a word on my tongue, still unspoken. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you have placed your hand upon me. How close is God? A wonderful song set that we sang this morning. It really goes along with this, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, what I believe the scriptures say Really, 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 your love for me will never, ever, ever, ever be taken away from me. 
um, so appropriate, so applicable. You have enclosed me behind, you're before me, you're behind me, you're in front of me, your hand is on me. It's okay. God's got it. Truth is, God's got me. God's got you. God's got it. It goes on. Such infinite knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high above me. I cannot reach it. I love it when you encounter something that you can't even really take it all in, in your imagination, in your mind, in your understanding, and it's, you, you realize it is bigger than who I am. And our personal computers that God has given to us, we have nothing on earth that can match it. We're, we're trying. They have made some remarkable advances. But when, when it's, you are so staggered, as I was on Friday, as I pondered it, it gave me an opportunity this is nothing. God knows all this about everybody all the time who are alive, who ever lived, who are ever will live. He knows what we're going to say. He knows every thought we think. The room. God. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Where is it that I could go that God wouldn't be there? He wouldn't know. The psalmist said, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, hell, the place of the dead, behold, you're there. If, if I take wings of the dawn, and if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, that's where, that's where I live. What about God? And he says, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will take hold of me. Even there, you're there, encompassing me. In front of me, behind me, your hand on me. There's nowhere where I can go where you aren't. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me. It's dark, and it's so dark. It's dark outside. It's dark in my environment. It's dark. It feels dark inside of me. And the psalmist said, if I say, surely the darkness will cover me and, and, and the night will be the only light around me, he said, even the darkness is not dark to you and conceals nothing from you. But the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. There's no such thing as darkness to you. There's no time that he can't see that it's completely apparent. There's, there's no time. For you formed my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. When I was in the process of going through the, the developmental process of becoming, you were there. I will give thanks and praise to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it really well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being formed in secret and immediately and intricately and skillfully formed as if embroidered with many colors in the depths of the earth. It was like if it was an embroidery that had many beautiful colors, many colors, and it was in the depths of the earth, you were there. My eyes have seen my unformed, see, your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all, the were, were all written the days that were appointed to me. That's a scary statement. I know uh, I have Baptist in my heritage. I have Alliance in my heritage. I have Grace Orthodox Presbyterian in my heritage. I have Pente uh, assem not Assembly, not Pentecostal. I have um, Charismatic in my heritage. Uh, Presbyterian, I think I mentioned that. Presbyterian, Grace Orthodox but that almost is a no-no statement that we just sort of basically don't read. Because we don't like the implication. And in your book were all written the days that were appointed for me, when as yet there was not one of them even taking shape. That means God has a book where he has his intention, his purposes, what he knows about our life. 
one dimension of your will be done on earth as your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, several months ago, it was like that became alive to me. Ah, just, and I used to think in just one uni dimension that it's perfect in heaven. There's no sin, there's no sickness, there's no re revolt, there's no rebellion, there's none of that in heaven. And I used to think in those dimensions, just like it is in heaven, it's perfect, there's no problems or so on. Let it be done here on earth, just like it is there. It's all agreement, it's all worship of Jesus. It's, and then this, it was like it was just made alive to me. It was, what's in heaven is the book, that book. There's your book, my book, the books. Just like it is in heaven, that's what's in heaven. It's in the library of heaven that uh, you're, when you're praying, Lord, your will be done, just like what you've written in my book, that your intentions for me, why you had me brought into being at this point in time in history, your will be done as it is in the books in library, the book relative to me as it is in heaven, your will be done here, as it is in heaven, like it's written down, like your intentions. The room. I visited the room on Friday. It was stunning. I couldn't believe they kept track of everything they kept track of. I, I just couldn't believe it. But as I began to... is I think the Spirit of God, I, I think he set me up with that gal saying on Sunday, last Sunday morning, the room we've never been in. I have never been in the room. And she was talking about this room. I've never been in the room. I've been everywhere else in the building, but not in the room. I, I believe God set me up because he was going to let me have an experience of the room and I would have an expanded look of, what if, what if you really had a sophisticated room that was really impressive? So impressive it staggered you. But as you compared it to God, it's maybe a speck of dust. Maybe. Probably one millionth of a speck of dust is how much it rates and ranks compared to God. Who, who's got it? Who knows it, knows everything. He's for you, he's seeking to guide you, giving you an opportunity, your chance, to play the role that he had for you in life. God's got it. He is the room. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God. We say three manifestations. He is the room. And you're covered. To me, that's good news. I don't always keep... It's not always that clear to me. However present God is. How aware of where I am, what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, what I'm saying. But when I come back to what I want to be ground zero, I live for Christ. I'm alive in Christ. I'm his servant. I'm his disciple. I want to fulfill his purposes for my life. When I'm thinking that actively, this is such good news to me. I'm not out there by myself. I'm not having to make it happen. God is with me.